Chaksu un militam yena tam vishnai Krishna prastaya bhutale Sri Mati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nir Vishesa Sunyavari Pastyatyare Satarine Panchakalpataru Vishya Kripa Sindhu Vevacha Vatitanam Bhavane Vyo Vaishnave Vyo Namaho Namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadar Har Sri Vasari Gaur Bhakta Rindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama I didn't really carefully plan anything but I came up with some ideas that I would just like to present for maybe general discussion. Um, I'll start by saying a phrase that is sometimes used to help us move in the right direction or move in a direction which is the right direction. And as they say, if you if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. If you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. By not planning, you are actually planning to fail. Um, take that again, one step further. Um, we learn from the past. The past is gone. Bhakti Vinod Thakur says, uh, near, uh, uh, let's see, let the past that sleeps near the future dream at all, act in times with our, that are with thee, and progress she shall call. He's basically saying the moment that we live in is the most important moment because the present, it's always the present. The future and the past don't exist. The past, we call that something that was at one time the future, but now it's no longer. And the future is something that will become the present, but presently it is not, it is just an idea or just a, a projection as of the of the lin, of the linear nature of time so looking at life we th we have to see that every moment that we have is an opportunity to become krishna conscious mm -hmm. um, the materialist people in the material world they have a tendency to lament about what happened in the past. Not only as they look back in the past, they feel bad. They lament. They think, well, I could have did this. I should have did this. If things were different, I would have did this. In other words, their mind spins around in the past, lamenting about what didn't happen or what did happen that they don't feel happy about. This is how the materialists usually see the past. They don't live in the present because they're not happy in their present situation. So they live in the future. They are planning to become happy in the future. So they make plans for the future. But their plan is not so much, it's not so much about the plan, it's about the idea of being happy by way of the plan that will come in the future. Because otherwise, people in the material world cannot live if they don't have this hope that the future will be better than the past and the present. Otherwise, they become negative, suicidal, uh, what we say, 
so introverted they can't function in a very proper way in any environment. This is where the materialistic people look. Uh, they simply dream about the future. Always dreaming that life will be better. Devotees are more realistic. Um, how does prophecy work? You know, we have a thing called prophecy where there are people who are very foresighted and they can somewhat predict the future based on two things, what happened in the past and what is happening in the present. Um, sometimes they say the best prophet is a false prophet. Now that sounds quite contradictory. The best prophet is a false prophet. What does that mean? It means that by studying the present and carefully understanding the past, they can say that this will happen if we follow the same patterns that we are going in. But if you change, then what was what will, would have happened won't happen. So there's where the false prophet comes in. They give you a chance to see that in the direction you're going, it's going to be the same way. Sometimes devotees have that problem in life where they, uh, they keep getting the same results from the activities they do. Why? Because they do the same activities. <laughs> uh, they're habituated to doing the same thing and therefore they're hoping that the outcome will be different or better. But it doesn't work that way because as long as you're doing the same thing, you're going to get generally the same result. <laughs> That's how material energy works. And so we say, you know, change the way you think and change the way you act and you also change the results. And that's, that's just logical and practical. But because of being habituated or attached to a certain way of doing things, uh, the living entity stays within that condition paradigm and therefore just simply continues the lament the outcome that comes, not feeling happy or satisfied. So a devotee, now devotee also plans for the future. It's not like a devotee doesn't plan for the future, but their planning for the future is based on their understanding of the past, not lamenting about the past, and seeing what is happening in the present how to improve the quality of life at every moment, which will automatically, and I use that word very emphatically, automatically change what happens in the future. By carefully understanding how life went on in the past, we're talking about one's personal lifestyle, activities, experiences, lessons learned, lessons not learned, um, and presently analyzing the person, present situation, where do I want to go? Which direction do I want to go in? Some people call it planning for the future. We, make, we, we use a different terminology. We say it is the intelligent way to increase the quality of life in such a way that we maximize the benefits of devotional service in such a way that we are no longer becoming a victim of the results, but the real the results actually become, you know, very pleasing to offer to Krishna and of course, beneficial for us. So I'm heading towards a particular point that I want to emphasize. And this is a general point that has been emphasized previously in many lectures. And that is, what is the future of our movement as a society? And Srila Prabhupada kind of outlined that in many of his talks. 
And the future basically, he said, was based on that the material, present material situation, and this was probably by the 1970s, will only deteriorate. Material energy will only deteriorate. In other words, life will become more and more difficult living the way we're living. And gradually we'll start to crack and fall apart in many places. Where there will be more calamities, more wars, more sicknesses, more activities in the modes of passion and ignorance. And consequently, suffering will increase. This was Prabhupada's statement based if you carefully listen to his lectures, and I say that carefully because he makes these points sometimes just as part of a, another subject that he's talking about, but he continually makes this point that this material energy in our present way of living in this civilization will not last. He said this whole civilization will collapse. <laughs> um, and he said it over and over again such powerful and very sweeping statements. He said, there'll be a day when thousands of people will be dying in the streets. You might even say we're seeing that now in some places in the world. Um, based on not simply his spiritual power, which is really the foundation by which he makes his statements, because Srila Prabhupada was not simply a person who was a great personality. He was also directly and completely in contact with Krishna continuously. So he's receiving knowledge directly from Krishna. Not simply theoretical knowledge, but very direct understanding of how to spread Krishna consciousness with the understanding of what happened in the past, what is happening in the present, and where we as a society, or even where we as an individual within the society should be going in the future. And basically one of the things he kept saying over and over is that our present lifestyle will be threatened and challenged and ultimately forced to change. And what he made, means was the cities will fall apart. <laughs> and he said that generally we will have to, in order to carry on our Krishna consciousness society, we will have to move to a more simpler lifestyle, which is indigenous towards the living entities, spiritual and material growth a lifestyle that was more prominent maybe a couple hundred years ago, but not so much in the same design as we saw in the past, but a more modernized form of simplification, which still allows for many of the things we have today, but completely dependent or more dependent on Mother Earth and not dependent on, uh, you know, the uh, grocery store down the street or the, elect or the electrical company <laughs> that rules our, that keeps our home full of electricity, heat and whatever else we supposedly require to live in the present age. So what Prabhupada wanted and very much said is that we have to plan to come up with these farm communities. Of course, what we have in today is that around the world there are ISKCON communities that are developing in that direction. There are some very viable and very successfully moving in the right direction communities based on Srila Prabhupada's vision for a more simple, natural, healthy lifestyle, uh, which means more dependence on nature in a direct way rather than a less direct way, which we live now.
being somewhat fed by the materialist society for everything we need, food, you know, maintenance, clothes. And therefore Prabhupada, in, a very, in many lectures, he gave a very simple formula. He said, grow your own food. He said, make your own, he said also, grow your own crops where you can make cloth to make the clothes you need. He said, learn, not for everybody, but a class of men, a class of people should learn how nature is constituted with everything medicinal for every type of disease. Mother nature has all the ingredients for all cures of every disease within mother nature. We call that the science of herbology or learning how, what is in nature, how to extract it, how to process it and how to turn it into viable medicines, which are complete. Uh, it's, there's not one particular disease you can't cure when you, you know the science of herbology and how to process. And modern medicine, although they mix so many chemicals in with the medicines they give you, they still take things from Earth, Mother Earth and then add these chemicals. So they also depend on that. Of course, we want to be free from all this chemical warfare that's being given to us in the form of the medicines they hand on, they hand us. Because most of these chemicals are what they are, they're chemicals. <laughs> and many of them are destructive to the human body. Uh, so, and then Prabhupada said, and uh, grow your, make your own homes. In other words, take fallen trees, collect wood, or even grow trees and then make houses, houses where you can live in. Of course, there are also companies today that can also make simplified houses that's being done in some of our communities around the world. When I was in um, Gobernaneco village, the devotees were showing us a demonstration on how they were collecting sand, adding a certain amount of water and putting it into a, a form and then under pressure making a brick without the heating process. <laughs> Uh, well, they would make the brick, yeah, and once they get the brick made like that, then they put it into the fire, into the kiln, and then it formulates that into a solid brick. So all uh, building materials could just be made from three ingredients, water, earth, and fire. That's all you need. <laughs> and you can make your own houses with bricks, natural bricks coming from the earth. Um, and you also, you can also use the wood. So Mother Earth has, has surprised, su supplied everything we need. We, we don't need to work, you know, like years and years amassing, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars in order to buy a house, <laughs> spending hundreds of thousands of hours of hard work just to get a house. When in a more, in a, when a more of a rural type of setting, people working together, just like there's one community in uh, Indiana, they're also in Pennsylvania, they are called the Amish. They can build a house in three days, a full two-story house in three days. They all come together, they all know which part of the house that they have to work in, they have the building, building materials already, and then they work in three days and you have a house, <laughs> three days. They, they're expert at it. They've been doing it for many generations. They build their own homes like that. So, um, of course, and they don't have any electricity nor any me mechanical conveyances they use. They use horses and buggies like that. 
but we don't have to go into a very simplified lifestyle to live simply. The basic principles of simple living is to get away from this materialistic society, depending on whatever we need. And as society continues to uh, falter on different levels, we can speak about the economic faltering. Uh, I just heard something very alarming <laughs> in the United States of America. They just printed $7 trillion worth of new currency. Now, anybody who knows economics knows what that means. That means your prices are going to shoot sky high. <laughs> as soon as they put bad money into circulation, inflation just soars. Then it's going to start to soar more and more. And it's already soaring. What was easily purchased for a few dollars, will not, one will need much more to do the same thing. So we're living in a very defunctional society. It looks like it's still going on, but it's crumbling in different ways. And Prabhupada's vision was not something that he said that, well, I think it's going to happen. No, he said, this will be the future. If we do not do that, we will be victimized and forced to suffer under the, uh, the what is it called? The deterioration of the present materialistic society. So Prabhupada wanted these farm communities knowing that this is where we can put our emphasis on. It doesn't mean that we close down our temples in the cities. It simply means that we now focus our lifestyle in general as families, mostly for the families we're talking about, not so much for the brahmacharis or sannyasis. They're mobile, they can go anywhere. But also for them also, these farm communities are viable ways to fulfill our needs and at the same time preach and invite others to take part in Krishna consciousness. So we have, as Prabhupada said, we have our Vrindavan, we have our Mayapur, we have our GEV in, in above Bombay, we have in Hungary, we have in uh, Saranagrati, I think in Canada. There are many, many farm communities and then there's smaller ones all around the world that devotees have that are doing on a more local basis. So my... Uh, a reason for bringing up this subject is that along with continuing the way we are living now, because to make a shift is a big, big, big move, big change from the present direction we are heading, but slowly and at the same time planning that as, as time goes on, we should be thinking more and more about this more natural lifestyle, especially for those who have families. Uh, where we become, we are, we will be less able to fulfill our needs on a social, political, economic, aesthetic, moral, and spiritual level if we continue to depend on modern society. And this is being ha this is happening not only with, within devotee circles, but there's a very very large movement among the among the the non-devotees to extract themselves from today's society and create their own communities. Of course, their communities don't have any spiritual foundation. And because of that, or they have, maybe they have some spiritual foundation, they will also have problems. But Prabhupada gave the perfect formula, uh, living the spiritual within the simplified material allows for both to develop in such a way that one can fulfill all their needs naturally and have plenty of time for Krishna consciousness. Plenty of time for Krishna consciousness. And that's the most important thing. 
Okay, I just wanted to present this because I was thinking that uh, we should be thinking in that direction and not just waiting for everything to change in the world before we start to scramble and think, where, what am I gonna do when things become, what we say, worse. <laughs> so you might call me a doomsday prophet. I'm not a doomsday, I'm simply repeating Srila Prabhupada's words that society will not last, it will crumble. We need to establish these farm communities for the future of our movement, for the future of our devotees. If that sounds like a doomsday prophet, then I'm guilty because this is what Srila Prabhupada has been telling us in many, many of his lectures. Okay. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj. This topic is always very, very important and reminds us again and again uh, what was, you know, Srila Prabhupada's mission was, one of the mission uh, from seven mission principles that uh, to set up the SCON is oh, setting up the farm communities. So it's very important for us all to remember and, you know, follow it and uh, apply it in our life. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Devotees, if you have any questions, uh, comments, realizations, please unmute yourself and ask. Otherwise, you can write in the chat box. Thank you. Direction, Guru Maharaj. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm like, I'll ask my question maybe. Uh, that um, this is really always, you know, it, it strikes me that farm communities are very important for uh, this modern age and especially for devotees to, you know, uh, think forward. But I wonder if, like, you know, uh, if there is any support, any guidance, or any training has been given by GBC or uh, anyone because. I feel like we are trying to do something like this in South London, but funding is always an issue. Then um, you'll have to be, you know, near to the city to be able to, because kids are going to the school and things like that. And uh, near to the city, the land is very expensive. If you go further from the city, then you know you get you get bigger space. So it just there are so many struggles and questions comes when you start, you know, think about this type of projects. Um, so what is your advice on this, Guru Maharaj? Well, you know, you have two options. You can think in terms of the local community you're part of and organizing it on that level. And the other one is that you could simply think about becoming part of a already developing community. We have many already developing communities around the world. That simply means getting, replanting ourselves as part of these communities. And you might, you'd have to do some research to see what is the most uh, practical and viable according to your needs. But the other thing is to organize on a local level. And that takes time, energy, planning, adjusting. Uh, Prabhupada's vision was that every city temple should have a farm community connected with it. That was his, that's his exact words, where we preach in the cities and then for the most, and for mostly the, the, the farm communities are for the Grihasta couples, those with families. Brahmacharis and sannyasis can come, come in and out of those. They can also spend time there, but mostly for families, for setting up our own schools, for training and educating children, which we're doing, we call them gurukuls around the world. Sometimes they are part of the temple, sometimes they're separate. Um, and most important thing is agriculture, like that. So that take, you know, studying other, other communities, visiting other communities and seeing what they're doing, how they're doing it, seeing whether you can become, can become a part of that community or you can take from what they're doing and learn it and learn how to apply it and start 
communities in local areas like that. There's so much land and much of it is available. Of course, now it's becoming high, more higher and higher priced. But you have wealth when you have two things, when you have livestock, animals, and when you have land. If you don't have land or any kind of uh, livestock, you don't have any wealth at all because this paper money is just what it is, it's paper. <laughs> it's backed by the particular government that issues it. And you work, you get paid a piece of paper. And then the paper says it's good as long as the, the, the person behind the paper or the, the government behind the paper says it's good. They can change how much it's worth by changing the economy or the economy changes accordingly. And if the whole thing collapses, if the banks collapse, you just like what happened in 2008 in the UK, how many banks collapsed and people lost millions of millions of pounds. Same thing happened in India about four or five years ago, 2000 the end of 2016 and beginning of 2017 when Prime Minister Modi called back some of the, the money and reissued a whole different type of money. People who had that, that other currency was no longer any good anymore. He did that to stop the black marketing, which is a, a big, big part of today's modern society. People print money. <laughs> Yeah. So this paper money has no real, real wealth attached to it. It's simply what it is. It's good as long as as long as it's supported by the governments. So therefore, you really don't have any wealth. All you have is a promise that you have some future as long as the government works. But the Prabhupada said, real wealth is, you know, precious metals and uh, land. These are where you get wealth. How many people have precious metals? <laughs> <laughs> you have gold, if you have silver, if you have emeralds, if you have jewelry, don't sell it for paper money just to get some immediate cash. Keep it. It may be very valuable in the future. Yes. Okay. Yeah. No, that's a good point, Guru Maharaj. Thank you. That uh, yeah, if you uh, want to listen to a, an interesting talk by Srila Prabhupada, it's um, it's uh, a morning walk conversation, uh, December thirty first, nineteen seventy three, in Los Angeles. Okay. Yeah, you know, December 31st, 1973, morning walk talk in Los Angeles. Prabhupada talks about the whole idea of modern currency. Now, this is interesting. You know, Prabhupada is a powerful acharya. He's a purely spiritual person. He's talking so much about how to live, what's, what's governments, so many things. Why? Because he's preparing us for the future. He knows that the future, the society, the way we live in cannot last because it's based on the modes of passion and ignorance. It's not based on the mode of goodness. Most goodness can propagate itself. Passion and ignorance is selfish and destructive. And therefore you're seeing that today. So, Prabhupada's vision is these farm communities, and he gave the formula on how to how to begin, how to develop it, what is needed, like that. So it's not something he just said. He also filled it in with the ingredients that is needed in order for it to begin and develop. We have our Gita Nagri. And they're developing in that way. New Vrindavan. New Vrindavan it has all the ingredients for a wonderful farm community. 
but they're not they're not going in that direction at least not fast enough anyway and so we have many communities that have been developed over so devotees can see do i want to stay in these cities and take a chance <laughs> that everything will be all right do i want to expose my kids to these kinds of educations and these institutions that teach sense gratification as the goal of life. <laughs> Thank you, Guru Maharaj. It's a very good point that we can you know, go and check the existing communities and see, and maybe stay some time there, leave there, and, and see how it works, basically, how they manage it, how they do it, basically, because we have just heard it in the words. I think I've never seen personally any farm community apart from what has been built and managed in, like, in Bhaktivedanta manner, but manner is not, it's not a kind of, they have Goshala, but it's not a farm community. It's mainly temple, yeah, yeah, but something yeah, like well, hungry the, or... The face, basic farm community is agriculture. Cow protection follows agriculture. Agriculture is primary. Grow your own food. Mm. Yeah. That's what Mother Earth is for. The demons don't want us to do that. They want you to get off the farms, go into the cities and work like an ass. And then they'll create the foods from their productive farms, they call them these factory farms, and they sell them at such high prices like people can't even afford. And they continue to make millions of dollars off people's need for food. So. Yeah. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. It was very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Much more to this topic that we have time to discuss, but um, yeah. basically, I just wanted to make that point. We need to plan for the future, and this is, and we have to look towards what Prabhupada has given us as a vision. Thank you. We'll try. Hopefully, one day <laughs> it will happen. Well, we'll either have to do it or we'll be forced to do it. And when you're forced, it may also not work so good. Yeah. If you wait to buy a fire extinguisher after your house catches on fire, it might be too late. Better, <laughs> to, have the, better to have the fire extinguisher there in case the house catches on fire. <laughs> That's right. Good one. Thank you. Duties, if you have any questions, you can uh, unmute yourself and ask. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Oh, it's okay, Sridhar Mataji, please go ahead. Go, go ahead, Diptesh. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glory to Srila Prabhupada, all glory to you, Maharaj. Maharaj, thank you very much for this uh, uh, talks and I think restarting the discussions again. I think we had a very nice sessions before on this topic. And I think I'm still on the same point where I have con I have full faith in what needs to be done. Um, I lack courage to <laughs> make that move or try. Uh, although I am born in a farmer family, so my ancestors were farmers, we still have farming land in India. Um, I lack the courage to take it up or even try it at this point. So hopefully with these talks and with these constant reminders of what's happening in the material world outside and currently it will push me off the edge one day, hopefully. I don't think you lack courage, you just lack support. You know, when we do it together, it becomes easy. And natural. When we think and look at our own situation and think, how can I do it? We become overwhelmed. We're confused. But when we come together as a group, more and more families, then it becomes a, a plan and the plan develops into a vision. 
in a vision and develops into ideas on how to carry it out. And then people are mobilized. <laughs> so, but then again, I also said, knowing the situation with most people, it's not that we have to start something, but we can become a part of something that is already going. Yes, Maharaj, in the UK with Sitaram Prabhu, he's already expanding into some agriculture also. He's bought some more agricultural land and he's growing vegetables now. But uh, that would help, at least that's the nearest farm project for us near the manor. The materialistic controllers don't want you to do that. They want you to stay in the city so they can make, make money off people. Mm -hmm by supplying them. The necessities of life are given to us by God and they're supplied to us by the earth. They shouldn't be in hands of the political controllers who manipulate these things and manipulate people in order to make large amounts of profit off, off people's basic needs. That's why when you look back at a more simplified uh, country, you'll see people are simply depending on nature and working in that way. And not like we have to have, you know, someone to give us everything we need when it's already available. All you have to do is take it. <laughs> you see the point? They've put medicine and food into a business and they're selling it back to you when medicine and food is given to us by god through nature it's already there you can see how it's everything is being turned around simply for economic exploitation that's all and we go along with it thinking that's the way of life And for us, it may seem to be convenient, you know, but how long will that convenience go? What is the quality of the convenience that we have? We can see the, the air is polluted, the food is polluted, the water is polluted, people's minds are polluted. <laughs> Everything is polluted nowadays. Yeah, it's just because we don't live according to God's natural arrangement. God didn't just leave us here and say, good luck. He, ta he taught us how to live. <laughs> yes, Maharaj, also I was thinking that uh, a few days back that all the seeds of uh, the company which is monopolizing on the seeds and the world's biggest collector or actually provider of seeds is buyer. Yes. Uh, and, and, and they're kind of having a monopoly on the seeds, what to grow and everybody has to go through them somehow. Yeah, and, each, and you have to buy seed, new seeds each year. Yes, yes. You can't use the same seed year after year. They, they make it that way. It's a modified, it's a GMO product. Yeah, that's part of the control program to control people's foods. You have to buy the ingredients for the food you need from the people who are who have usurped that same stuff and they're selling it back to you. That's all in a more in a perverted in a in a uh, what's the word abrogated fashion in a kind of vulgarized way, you know. And if you have your own seeds and you start using that, they have, they've created laws against that now. <laughs> you have to use their own seeds. Monsanto, Cargill, Bayer, all these big, big places, 
They want to control the whole food supply like that. Just like you don't know what's going on, but behind the scenes, there's a big, big revolution in India with the farmers. The farmers are outrageous about what's happening, how they're being thrown off their farms and being pushed into, into more like poverty and into um, unemployment, un unactive lifestyle. I've seen recent films where farmers are actually organizing and they're in a mass way against all what's happening. They're trying to change India's entire culture around and make it a, a Western modernized culture, destroying the farms. And the highest suicide rate in India is in the farmers. And that's documented. The farmers are being no longer appreciated, throw off their land, not living properly. And uh, suicide is one of the results. This you don't see in the news because it's, it doesn't make interesting news. But it's happening. <laughs> Yes, Maha, yeah. thank you. So with hopefully with some courage and support, we can make the move. So please give us your blessings, Maharaj. Yeah, the idea is to start planning now with ideas and discussions. When you start talking about it and getting ideas for it, then plans start to you know materialize. But if you just let it go and just wait for things to change. They may change, but may not always be favorable. <laughs> Raupad was not simply a person who focused on the spiritual. He understood, he, he says, he said, he said, I came to make a whole rev a revolution on the, the entire society from the bad grass roots all the way up to the top, political, social, economic, medical, ecclesiastic, anything. Prabhupada wanted to bring Krishna conscious principles and lifestyle into all, all areas of society. That was Prabhupada's vision. And he even said that himself. And he laid out all the plans too on how to do it. It's interesting. If you really study carefully Prabhupada's books and his lectures, you'll find the most amazing uh, things that you're not aware of or what Prabhupada said about how we must practice Krishna consciousness as time goes on and as the social and political fabric, economic fabric also of the societies become uh, affected by change. Prabhupada hasn't been wrong yet. <laughs> it's not, nothing he said has been wrong. Some of it hasn't come because it hasn't, the time hasn't manifest yet, but he hasn't been wrong in anything he's said so far. Raupad was a, you know, he was a, he was a visionary, spiritual visionary. <laughs> Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Uh, Shidevi Mataji, you have a question? Thank you, Anjali. Dear Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to your holiness. As uh, the Pesh Prabhu said, thank you for again uh, bringing up this very uh, important topic. And uh, to me, I, I definitely feel a big sense of urgency uh, because I'm actually seeing what is happening today right here in New Orleans with the hurricane season beginning, 
people panicking, people losing their homes, becoming homeless. I mean, the situation is actually very dire given what is happening to Mother Earth. So there's, to me, there's no time to lose, actually. That's the way I see it. The faster we move on this, the better, according to me. But at the same time, I understand that what, what will people in the cities do in the meantime can they encourage people to start uh, having urban farms or some kind of uh, growing their own uh, flowers, fruits, uh, something, some vegetables, something to well, create? We, yeah, we, we have to start it within an ISKCON society. We, this is where we started. They're doing whatever they're doing, and we can also be the model for something that they can learn from. But we, we can't even go into their society and expect to start something with them. We have to work within our own society. Yeah. That's the whole thing. We, uh, if we don't get it together ourselves, how are we gonna teach anybody else you know, as a society, as a community? So you have your new Taliban that has the, what we say, the ingredients to develop the, in that direction. You have your Mayapur. Now in Mayapur, there's a huge uh, agricultural project that just recently started last year where devotees are really seriously working to take care of all the food supplies on a local level now. So it's happening around the world. You just have to see whether you can be part of whatever is happening or start something with the devotees in the area you're in, either one. Guru Maharaj, Hare Krishna, please accept my humble obeisances. Hare all glories to Srila Prabhupada and all glories to you. Yeah, thank you so much for talking about this. It was very interesting. Yesterday I had, um, I looked at this documentary from France and this woman, actually, she went to uh, the Southwest of the United States and learned, she joined an organization and you were just saying we should, you know, we have to learn how to do this ourselves. She didn't know how, she and her husband, but they went through a, um, an organization which was um, self-sustaining lifestyle. And they learned how to build a home. And um, in the front of the home, it's almost like having a greenhouse within the house. And they learned how to uh, uh, grow all of their vegetables and fruits inside but it's outside. I don't know how to explain perfectly, but it's like a little greenhouse that's attached in the front. And they were completely self-sustaining. And then they, um, you know, with the water and everything, all the water they used, um, they would take showers and wash dishes, et cetera. And all that water would get filtered back into the plants so that they could use it. And they said they had, you know, food all year long. And she, she stayed in the, the Southwest uh, like in New Mexico for five years and then brought it back to France. And she, they told her she was crazy and she and her husband did it. And I mean, it's phenomenal. They're not using the, the government for their electricity or for anything. They have every, all the generators, everything set up so that they're self-sustaining. So I, I, you know, it just really went along with what you're talking about. And, uh, yeah, that's all. I just wanted to share that. It's, it's, it is possible, yeah. but it, you, they really needed to know how to do it. It was not simple. It was not simple. Yeah, but as people are doing it now, you can simply learn from them. That's all. Just like you were there when we were there in Govardhan Echo Village, you saw how they're also doing these things. Yes. How they're recycling plastic and using that plastic for different things you saw the brick making you also saw the the uh the septic area where <laughs> as one as Radhana Swami said every time you flush your toilet you the papayas grow bigger <laughs> <laughs> yes that's true yeah so what what they said it um, 
there was some real amazing technology where septic waste is being filtered, broken down and redistributed for fertilizer and growing many, many wonderful plants that are completely healthy, pure like that. So the technology is there, <laughs> it's being done. Simply you have to learn it if you wanna do it yourself. It's not like we have to invent something new. There's so many different types of self-sufficient communities that have many of the basic ingredients that are required for all areas that we need, food, clothing, shelter, sustainability, like that. And this is where the cows come in. The cows are also a big part of the economic stability of a community also, because they provide so much. So, do, you suggest, do you suggest, Guru Maharaj, that we learn from some of these uh, institutions so that we know how to do it and then bring it to, the, uh, to ISKCON? It just it requires a few people to learn how to do it, but we, but you need a community to do it in. That's what it, that's all. It's like you're in Chicago. The Chicago the Chicago have a rural community attached to it. I don't think so. No. I know some of the neighborhoods are growing vegetables and things in in parks, you know, you go to a certain area and everybody puts their, uh, uh, they have their plot and people are growing vegetables uh, and fruits there and other flowers, but it's not something that's done all year long. I mean, that that takes a lot of work to learn how, in a that, cold climate. That's more, that's more individual. It's not like community effort. Um, what you need is the devotees working together <laughs> in a more communal type environment. And these, yeah, like I said, you don't have to start anything. All you have to do is join something that's, that's already viably happened. Or if you want to stay in your own area and start something, then there's a whole process that you need to develop. And that may take years, but... But my basic principle is that this, the lifestyle we live is already being threatened and it's only going to continue to deteriorate. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Yeah, I mean, there's not even enough natural fossil fuel to maintain the present population. We take 50% more each year from the earth than the earth produces. The earth produces say 100% and we take 150%. And that's continually increasing every year. So the earth is being burdened more and more by this type of lifestyle, pollution, you know, noise, uh, so we were living in pretty much a, uh, a very artificial and very tenuous lifestyle. It could collapse at any time. <laughs> it doesn't have any foundation. It simply depends on the political situation we're in. And even that, when it's ideal, is not making people happy because it's not natural. Totally agree, yes. Yeah, so I'm just putting out the word again <laughs> because it's needed to be reminded that, you know, we shouldn't be oblivious to what's happening now and where we're going in the future as a, as a society. And of course, a lot of this that I'm saying is for people who have influence in our society, the leaders who can actually make a difference. But the devotees also, although they may not be in leadership positions, can influence the leadership. Thank you very much, Guru Maharaj. 
Yes. Hare Krishna. Hare, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, yes, Vrindavanath Prabhu, you can go ahead. Thank you, Mataji. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to you, Guru Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, thank you for this uh, really, really important and critical topic. Uh, it needs really a revolutionized, in my view, and transformative approach. Like setting up self-sustaining community uh, using natural resources, uh, including full farm community, Gurukul, Goshala, it like needs properly planned and organized approach. So I have two questions, Guru Maharaj. Uh, although you briefly touched upon, but I'm still, sorry, not very clear. So thought to uh, just ask. Uh, you mentioned that it needs a collective approach uh, because it's very difficult to do just at the individual level if it has to be done in the same location. It's struggling to really decide how to bring various leaders and devotees together because that's like, as you said, like it has to be done with some influence. And even like uh, few devotees decide it needs like a group of devotees, not just maybe two or three to set it up at that level, like setting up everything self-sustaining. And uh, second question, I, I'm not sure like when you said be part of that community, does it mean relocating to that place or learning and leveraging from their experience? Either one, learning and le learning, relocating may also be required at a certain stage. That may also be required based on, you know, the, what we say, uh, precarious situation we have in our present life lifestyle, which is too much dependent on, you know, the political and social environment, economic environment also. So yeah, um, both. <laughs> like I said, I'm, I've threw out the, the ideas based on what I understand from Prabhupada's vision and some of the things uh, in a procedural form, I gave two series of lectures over the last two years, and bo both of them are going to be printed into a book. We're still editing the uh, talks to make it printable. Um, the second one we did in the beginning of this month, I think, uh, uh, what was it? What was it? April or May? I gave four talks on self sufficiency No, it was actually before that. I think it was in March. Yeah, that was in Gurumai in March. Yeah. Yeah. And then I did one in May of 2020. The one in May of 2020 is almost fully edited, the four lectures. And then I did four more lectures, which somewhat, somewhat pattern the one I did the previous year. So I want to put them into a more of a readable form where devotees can, again, get reminded of some of the ideas and the, the viability. To understand the viability of this lifestyle is a big part of moving in that direction. We think the present lifestyle will, will continue to go on, and we're, we're, we're in that that idea that it will go on. But we're seeing how much is being threatened presently and will continue to be as situations in this world become more deteriorated. The deterioration comes around moral debilitation. When morality takes a dive, Everything else goes down. That's why nobody can fix any material problems unless they deal with the problems on the level of the uh, on the level of the individual. You can't make plans to have a better society by a bunch of people who are <laughs> who are sinful, <laughs> no matter how intelligent they are. As long as they're sinful, it's not going to be supported. <laughs> 
by God or by nature. <laughs> They're gonna simply get the reactions of their sinful activities in the forms of whatever plans they make, even though it may be a nice plan. So that's the point. That's why no material solution will create, create any material, no material plan will make a material solution because people are sinful. <laughs> they're living sinful lives. They live against the laws of God and they're exploiting material nature. Until that changes, nothing in the world on the material level will get any, and it will, will, will not get any better. It will simply de deteriorate more and more. More diseases, more problems, more calamities, and maybe even more wars. You know? uh, that's why Prabhupada's lifestyle is the foundation for the execution of not only Krishna consciousness, but the entire social, political, and economic uh, development of society. <laughs> so Guru Maharaj, like it's a very, very critical and very important uh, topic for like uh, future, uh, including like today, but uh, like from the devotee side as well as uh, from the leaders of the uh, ISKCON, I think it should be really, really uh, raised as a critical point because it needs yeah. really a proper... Uh, yeah, it, need, it needs to be raised, you know, and of course, even within our society, the leaders who are raising the points to the society, the society is saying, okay, what you say is good, Go ahead and do it. So it's not like it's a uniformative type of pl plan where all everyone in, in, in this kind is moving in that direction. No, it's not like that. There are a few leaders who are actually working in that area. And for them, because they have their support from their congregations, from their disciples, from the resources that they have gathered, they've come up with plans, Bhakti Chiru Maharaj that was doing something wonderful in Ujjain. He wanted to start something. He was actually started something in Dilan, Florida. That was where he was headed before he came down with the, with the disease and got sick. He, yeah, but he had the vision. He wanted to do it in, in Florida. And that community is still there. Of course, now the, He's no longer there to direct it, but his devotees are trying to work in that area. So he started something very serious. He was willing to risk his life to go to that community to get it moving. And that's what he did. He took a chance to travel to get there. Unfortunately, he got sick on the way. So yeah, you have you had Bhakti Turiya Radhana Swami who was doing an amazing project in just north of Bombay called Govardhan Echo Village, which has all the ingredients of self-sufficient and spiritual development side by side, uh, developing both as a, a livable community and as a community that is sustainable by economic uh, standards, by agricultural standards, by so yeah, and inviting other people to take part of it from the outside to see, to see how it goes and, and learn from it. You have Shiva Ram Maharaj doing something in Hungary on the same level. So you have some leaders who have dedicated themselves and you have other leaders who are doing some, you have Bhakti Raghava Swami in, in um, India and with a few of his projects, he's 100% focused on what I said. He's, he lives it 24-7. That's his whole focus is to develop these farm communities, cow protection, agriculture, sustainability. 
he's in India and he's doing it there. He has a couple projects going with his men. So yeah, then you look around and you see some of the other leaders who have something going on these levels. And there's others who don't have anything going. <laughs> So you see, it's, it's an individual effort coming from certain leaders who have, in, who have taken Srila Prabhupada's instructions and put it into a working formula. <laughs> and if you investigate what I just mentioned, you'll see there's a lot of development in these areas, but it's not enough. It's not enough. There's also other ways that devotees on a local level can also begin something, provided they have enough devotees to, to get things off the ground. One person can't do it alone, it's not possible. You need at least three or four families and then some support and some resource and a plan to get things going if you wanna do it from that, you know, basic uh, principle. There are many options to work with to you know, see where you can fit in or where you can actually develop something. You can explore those different options. Mm -hmm. The point of my lecture today is to re- remind everybody where we should be going because <laughs> we have a tendency to forget and just fall back into our complacent lifestyle and think oh things will go on the way it is and we may not even notice <laughs> how things are deteriorating all around us constantly Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Definitely, it's a good reminder and awakening call. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, Sri Devi Mataji has commented that the light, the flower frog in slowly boiling water. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we can't. We we have a tendency not to see things until it's until it's right in front of us. <laughs> uh, so, Guru Maharaj, if there is no other questions, we can close the call. Okay, we can stop here, and we'll see you all tomorrow, Tuesday. <laughs> Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Shila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Thank you, Maharaj Hare Krishna.